Bhagavad Gita as it is, chapter 15, which has 20 verses, is entitled The Yoga of the Supreme Person. In Sanskrit, the Supreme Person is known by the word Purushottama, which is actually two words, Purusha Uttama. And we will see in this chapter how Purusha Uttama is Krishna. In the first section of this chapter, we will get an understanding of reality and its perverted reflection. And it will not be what you are probably thinking. Listen carefully. The Supreme Personality of Godhead said, It is said that there is an imperishable banyan tree that has its roots upward and its branches down and whose leaves are the Vedic hymns. One who knows this tree is the knower of the Vedas. The branches of this tree extend downward and upward, nourished by the three modes of material nature. The twigs are the objects of the senses. This tree also has roots going down, and these are bound to the fruitive actions of human society. The real form of this tree cannot be perceived in this world. No one can understand where it ends, where it begins, or where its foundation is. But with determination, one must cut down this strongly rooted tree with the weapon of detachment. Thereafter, one must seek that place from which, having gone, one never returns, and there surrender to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, from whom everything has begun and from whom everything has extended since time immemorial. So, this material world that you and I live in is a perverted reflection of the reality so if the world we're living in is a perverted reflection, where is the reality? Well, Krishna mentioned that. That place from which having returned, one never comes back here, indicates the spiritual world, the abode of Krishna. That is the reality. This world that we live in is a perverted reflection. Let me give you a good example. Where is there the experience of an upside down tree? Well, if you're standing on one bank of a lake and on the other side across the lake is a tree, if you look in the water, the tree will present itself upside down. Therefore, this material world that we are living in is an upside down tree or a perverted reflection of the reality and Krishna was saying again what he has said many times how to get out of it how to cut down this perverted tree very simple you have to surrender to the supreme personality of Godhead Krishna himself because he is the absolute truth it is from he that everything is coming Krishna continues, Those who are free from false prestige, illusion, and false association, who understand the eternal, who are done with material lust, who are freed from the dualities of happiness and distress, and who, unbewildered, know how to surrender unto the Supreme Person, they attain to that eternal kingdom. So the eternal kingdom, that's the reality. And the symptoms were given very much similar to what he said in the previous chapter about the symptoms of one who has transcended the modes of nature. You have to surrender to Krishna. He said that in chapter 7 also, that he said, my material energy, it is Krishna's material energy, is insurmountable, most difficult. But if you surrender to me, Krishna says, you can easily cross beyond it. Same thing again. 
You want to get out of this perverted reflection? You want to cut down this strongly rooted tree of material illusion? Only one way, surrender to Krishna. And you can surrender to Krishna right now if you want. Simply chant along with me, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Now, Krishna will describe a little bit about his supreme abode. That supreme abode of mine is not illumined by the sun nor moon, nor by fire or electricity. Those who reach it never return to this material world. This is great news, giving us great hope that if we can reach Krishna's abode, we don't have to come back to this material world. It is self-illumined, no need of a sun or a moon, because here in this material world, everything is dark. We need a sun and moon and fire to light up everything because by nature it's dark. But in Krishna's abode, everything is self-luminous and everything is ultimately resting upon Krishna. He continues. In the next verses, 7 through 11, Krishna will help us to understand the position of ourselves as a conditioned soul. This is very informative. The living entities in this conditioned world are my eternal fragmental parts. So this is the first thing, that we are not part of this material world. We are all sons and daughters, the children of God. We are little, little fragmental samples of Krishna. This is why Krishna said at the beginning in chapter 2, that never was there a time when I did not exist, nor you, nor all these kings, nor in the future shall any of us cease to be. Because each and every one of us, having existed since time immemorial, just like Krishna, just like God, we've always existed. So we have the qualities of Krishna, but in a fragmental uh, quantity. We have the qualities of Krishna, eternal, full of bliss and knowledge, but we don't have the quantity or the potentiality. We are fragmental parts of Krishna. The Sanskrit word in this verse, angsha, we are Krishna's fragmental parts and the part is never equal to the whole. But we are Krishna's fragmental parts. We should understand. Remember in the previous chapter, he said that I am the seed giving father of all living entities who take their birth in the womb of this material energy. So he is the father. He is everyone's father. Now he continues. Due to conditioned life, meaning this material world, they are struggling very hard with the six senses, which include the mind. So the six senses, the hearing sense, the seeing sense, smelling sense, touching sense, and tasting sense. These are the five senses or knowledge acquiring senses. And there is the mind, which is the master sense, the subtle sense. And this is what's going on in this material world. We are struggling, simply trying to placate the demands of these material mind and senses. But Krishna all along, even in the previous chapter, has been telling us to transcend the body and mind by performance of devotional service. The living entity conditioned by the material world thinks that its business is to simply satisfy the demands or pushings of these material senses and mind. And the whole human race is going on under this misconception. But Bhagavad Gita began by Krishna indicating you're not your senses, you're not your mind, you're not a product of this material world, you are eternal. And now he is saying, not only are you eternal, you are my eternal fragmental part and parcel. You belong to me if one can accept us. 
if one can surrender to Krishna and act as Krishna's fragmental part and parcel servitor, then one can transcend the modes of nature and no longer have to struggle in this material world. He continues, the living entity in this material world carries his or her different conceptions of life from one body to the another as the air carries aromas. Thus, one takes one kind of body and again quits it to take another. We learned this in chapter 2 as well, that even in this body we are seeing how the body is changing from boyhood to youth to old age to death. But the soul remains the same. Here Krishna has again reiterated the concept, a very basic concept, of transmigration of the soul. That you're going to be taking different kinds of bodies, all depending on the mentality that one has been fostering in this human form of life. So it is very important to make the right decisions of life, to become Krishna conscious, so that one does not have to take another material body again. Krishna continues, The living entity, thus taking another gross body, attains a certain type of ear, eye, tongue, nose, and sense of touch, which are grouped about the mind. One thus enjoys a particular set of sense objects. So, what's indicated here is that the gross body changes at the time of death, but the subtle body, consisting of mind, intelligence, and false ego, that continues with the soul onto its next body. The soul, as long as it remains in this material world, has this covering of mind, intelligence, and false ego. The gross body changes, but the subtle body remains. This is quite amazing. If you think about it, you've had the same mind, intelligence, and false ego for millions and millions and millions of different bodies and births that you've taken. The body has changed, but the subtle body you have been carrying this baggage since time immemorial. And the process of surrendering to Krishna means the subtle body is dissolved. When there's no more subtle body, no more material mind, intelligence, and false ego, then there'll be no more need of a gross material body. That is the stage of liberation. That is the stage of perfect Krishna consciousness. You remain in your original, pure identity as soul, part and parcel, fragmental, part and parcel, eternal servant of Krishna, and now you are eligible to reside in Krishna's kingdom, the spiritual world. The foolish cannot understand how a living entity can quit one's body, nor can they understand what sort of body one enjoys under the spell of the modes of nature. But one whose eyes are trained in knowledge can see all this. So a foolish person is someone who thinks, I am my body, I am my senses, I am my mind. Whatever my mind and body are dictating, I must satisfy that. That's the foolish person. But a person who follows Bhagavad Gita, a person who begins to surrender to Krishna, that person can understand what is happening. And as we learned before, even at the hour of death, one can remain unbewildered. A foolish person will certainly be bewildered at the time of death, but one who has been practicing Bhagavad Gita will not be bewildered. Krishna continues, The endeavoring transcendentalists who are situated in self-realization can see all of this clearly, meaning the change of the body. But those whose minds are not developed and who are not situated in self-realization 
cannot see what is taking place, even though they may try so. So, if you haven't practiced Bhagavad Gita, don't think that at the time of death, you're going to get away scot-free. No. You have to practice Krishna consciousness now. That's why Krishna said to Arjuna in chapter 8, execute your prescribed duty, but at the same time think of me. Krishna consciousness means executing, practicing now. Don't wait for old age or death because it'll be too late. You won't have the stamina. You won't have the strength. You won't have the determination. You have to start practicing now. In the next three verses, Krishna will explain some more of his vibhutis or opulences. We heard about these in chapter 7 and we heard extensively about them in chapter 10. Now Krishna wants to revisit some of these. Listen carefully. The splendor of the sun, which dissipates the darkness of this whole world, comes from me. And the splendor of the moon and splendor of fire are also from me. So Krishna wants to remind us these things, the sun, the moon, fire, where are they getting their special potency from? They're not independent. Krishna says that potency is coming from me. I enter into each planet and by my energy they stay in orbit. Yes, even the planets floating in the outer space. Why is that happening? Because Krishna is doing it. I become the moon and thereby supply the juice of life to all vegetables. I am the fire of digestion in the bodies of all living entities. And I join with the air of life, outgoing and incoming to digest the four kinds of foodstuffs. The four kinds of foodstuffs, foods which are licked, chewed, drunk, and sucked. And here we see Krishna saying, even for your eating, the ability to digest food, that's me. Even ourselves, this material body, in order for it to function, we need Krishna. So we are not independent. Only the fool thinks I am independent. But a student of Bhagavad Gita knows it is by Krishna's grace that I am able to eat and digest. Now, the final section of this chapter is entitled Yoga of the Supreme Person. And again, Supreme Person Purusha Uttama, Purushottama. This is very nice information. I urge you to listen very carefully. I am seated in everyone's heart. So this Krishna has said several times in this Bhagavad Gita. Krishna is seated in the heart in his manifestation as super soul, Paramatma. We learned about this in chapter 13. And from me come remembrance, knowledge, and forgetfulness. Just see how we are not independent. Krishna says, I cause you to remember. I give you the knowledge and I cause you to forget. So there are two classes. One is the demon and one is the devotee. For the devotee, Krishna helps him to remember Bhagavad Gita and its instructions and to remember Krishna. And as we learned in chapter 10, for someone who is sincere and serious, Krishna, within the heart, with the shining lamp of knowledge, gives one the intelligence how to once again fully return to Krishna. And what does Krishna do to the devotee to help him forget? Krishna helps the devotee forget his material desires because it is those material desires that keep one bound to this material world. So Krishna, out of his compassion for his devotee, helps the devotee forget all material desires. Now, 
How does Krishna do this for the demon? For the demon, Krishna helps him to forget Krishna. Just see, Krishna helps the demon to forget him forever. And Krishna will give the demon that kind of knowledge by which the demon will never surrender to Krishna. And Krishna reminds the demon more and more of all of his material desires because that's what the demon wants. As Krishna said in chapter 4, as they surrender unto me, I reward them accordingly. The demon is someone who doesn't want to love God or Krishna. So Krishna helps him. Okay, you don't want to surrender. You don't want to love me. I'll help you. I'll remind you of all your material desires. I'll cover your spiritual knowledge so that you'll forget that you're my eternal part and parcel. And I'll help you to forget me forever. Krishna continues, By all the Vedas, I am to be known. So there are many Vedas, Upanishads, Puranas, the Mahabharata, all of these compiled by Krishna's incarnation of Vyasadeva. But here is the point. By all of these books, the purpose is to find Krishna. The purpose is to surrender to Krishna. That is why this Bhagavad Gita is a summary of all the Vedas. Because what is Krishna saying? You can study the four Vedas, 108 Upanishads, 18 Puranas, the Mahabharata, you're only going to come to one conclusion if you actually read these objectively. And that is, you're going to find me, Krishna, and surrender. Krishna says, now, I am the compiler of Vedanta. The Vedanta refers to the Vedanta Sutras, compiled by Vyasadeva, an incarnation of Krishna. And I am the knower of the Vedas. Indeed, Krishna is the knower of the Vedas, because the Vedas were originally spoken by Narayan, a form of Krishna, to Lord Brahma at the dawn of creation. So if anybody knows the Vedas, it's Krishna because he is their author. There are two classes of beings, the fallible and the infallible. So here Krishna is pointing out that you will find two classes of living beings, here they are. In the material world, every living entity is fallible. And in the spiritual world, every living entity is called infallible. In the spiritual world, where living entities are infallible, they are infallible because they are one with Krishna's desire. They are one with Krishna's interest. There's no different opinion in the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of God, everyone has the same conclusion. How can we serve and satisfy Krishna? In the material world, everyone is fallible because everyone is trying to imitate Krishna. This is indeed why we have entered this material world and have left Krishna's kingdom. We have left Krishna's kingdom because we want to imitate Krishna. In the kingdom of God, in the spiritual world, everyone wants to serve Krishna. And in the material world, everyone's trying to be or imitate Krishna. And therefore, in the material world, it's a dream which can never come true. It's a hope which is never to be fulfilled. Because no matter how hard we try and no matter how hard we want it, we cannot become something which we are not meant for. We already learned in verse number seven of this chapter that we are Krishna's fragmental part and parcel. The part cannot equal the whole. Krishna is the whole. So even though we may want to imitate Krishna. It's not that we become something different. We're still the fragmental part and parcel, whether we're in the spiritual world or the material world. The part can never become the whole. And therefore, it's ludicrous for the living entity in the material world to think that someday 
he or she will become equal to God. It's just not possible. There's no applications being taken. The job has already been fulfilled. Krishna is God. He has stated that in the Bhagavad Gita. And there's no second God. As he said, I am the God of all gods. But we are allowed to imagine. We are allowed to pretend. We are allowed to dream and try to become God. But it's never going to happen. And what's happening in this material world? I'm trying to be God. You're trying to be God. And ultimately, we will clash. We will fight. That's the material world. Now he continues. Besides these two, meaning the fallible and the infallible, there is the greatest living personality, the Supreme Lord, the imperishable Lord himself, who has entered the three worlds and is maintaining them. So here Krishna once again stipulates that he is above everyone. This is why he's Purushottama, Purusha Uttama. Yes, there are fallible and infallible living beings, but above them both, beyond them both, is Krishna. This is why repeatedly he has said, I am God. And Krishna is so kind that he is maintaining this material world by his expansion of Vishnu. Krishna continues, Because I am transcendental, beyond both the fallible and the infallible, and because I am the greatest, I am celebrated in this world and in the Vedas as that supreme person. So once again, Krishna has stipulated, I am God. I am Purushottama, the supreme person. Not the supreme imperson. He's the supreme person. As we mentioned in the previous chapter, the impersonal feature is subordinate to the personal. And Krishna once again is emphasizing, I am celebrated as the supreme person. One has to give up envy because it was envy, which is the original sin, which caused us to leave the spiritual world and enter this material world. We want to imitate Krishna. Why? We're envious. We want, we thought one day, what would it be like to be Krishna? Why should Krishna be the center of enjoyment? Why not me? And that's why we have come to this material world. And after a long struggle, if one is fortunate, one comes to the conclusion, I've tried to be God. Now I am fed up. I want to regain my true original identity of eternal servant of God. At that point, when the living entity desires to once again regain the spiritual status, Krishna sends the spiritual master who enlightens the conditioned soul how to go back home, back to Godhead. In this next verse, Krishna explains why it is so important to understand that he is God. And I will tell you that this verse was the first verse I memorized in my study of Bhagavad Gita back in 1973. So I'm very fond of this verse. Krishna now says, whoever knows me as the Supreme Personality of Godhead without doubting is the knower of everything. Just see. This is real knowledge. Real knowledge, complete knowledge is to be convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt that Krishna is God. Sometimes our faith not being very strong we may accept Krishna as God, but then something happens and then we have doubts. So therefore, our knowledge is not complete. But when we actually know everything, when our knowledge is complete, the test of that knowledge will be, oh yes, Krishna is my Lord, unconditionally, no matter what. That is full knowledge. That Krishna is God, 
and I am his eternal servitor. Nothing more, nothing less. One therefore engages him or herself in full devotional service to me. This is why we study Bhagavad Gita, so that we become convinced that Krishna is God. We read Bhagavad Gita to convince ourselves. We are on a shadow of a doubt. Yes, Krishna is the Supreme. I am his part and parcel. I am meant to eternally serve him. I have no other function. And in this way, I'll be happy. Final verse of this chapter. This is the most confidential part of the Vedic scriptures, O sinless one. And it is disclosed now by me to you. Whoever understands this will become wise and their endeavors will know perfection. So this verse explains to us the keys to the kingdom of God. That if you can know Krishna as the supreme God of all gods and that you are his eternal part and parcel, then everything you do after that, little by little, will be perfectly done and you'll become completely happy and blissful. So this is confidential. This is the most confidential knowledge to know that Krishna is the Supreme Lord. The resolution should be, yes, I am convinced. Now let me render service to Krishna uninterrupted. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare.